What is the true value of a great university such as Texas A&M? It's the outstanding Aggies, the women and men who graduate and go out from our university to make our world a better place and who then come back and reinvest in the next generation of outstanding Aggies. In this, the first of a series on outstanding Aggies, it is my privilege to introduce you to Dennis Jerky, class of 78, who over a 35 year career leveraged his A&M landscape architecture and urban design foundations to create real estate value across the nation and the globe. But his research and creative achievements are now captured in a textbook. Dennis teaches pro bono, having returned to Texas A&M University to meet Provost Karen Watson's challenge, Aggies Commit, a dedication to service and to lifelong learning. As we embark on the Texas A&M University Capital Campaign, it is my honor to give you an outstanding Aggie, Dennis Jerky. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, a book that I have authored and talk about some uh, really new thinking and new principles related to how to uh, value real estate improvement projects. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor at Texas A&M, have 30 plus years of private sector experience and uh, uh, have gathered a lot of information over that 30 plus years and, and put them in the form of a book that was published by the Urban Land Institute in December of 2009. Uh, it's called Urban Design and the Bottom Line, uh, Optimizing the Return on Perception, and it talks about, I'll explain to you, uh, the principles of the book and how uh, it's very important to understand the holistic value of real estate assets versus just uh, the bottom line spreadsheet value of real estate. So before I get into the, the meat of the book, I want to talk to you a little bit about some historical impacts on our country and on the uh, urban fabric of our country. Uh, Post-World War II, uh, there was a great emphasis on uh, the rapid growth of the country. The soldiers were returning from World War II, uh, starting families, and everybody was interested in uh, creating their little piece of heaven, uh, subdivision development, uh, suburban subdivision development, urban sprawl began to occur, uh, and the inner cities of uh, our country uh, were neglected. Uh, the automobile was king. Everybody wanted to have a car and their little piece of heaven out in suburbia. Uh, President Eisenhower developed the interstate highway system for defense purposes during the Cold War, uh, and all of these kinds of infrastructure improvements were developed very rapidly. Uh, so consequently, uh, cost effectiveness was the driving force, uh, the bottom line, the return on investment, not the return on perception was the focus. And so the country was rapidly developed using bottom line engineering principles, getting people, cars, and, and poop from point A to point B as rapidly as possible. So uh, after about two or three decades of this kind of development, the inner cities and the infrastructure of our uh, inner cities began to deteriorate and there was a great deal of concern uh, by everyone uh, about the declining conditions of urban America. So we began to refocus and rededicate our resources to redeveloping uh, the inner cities and turning them back into uh, their once promising uh, places to live, work, and play. So uh, if you look at the previous slide, you can see Embarcadero Avenue in the upper right hand corner. Uh, this was an engineering driven solution, the overpass that connected the Bay Bridge to uh, that area of, of San Francisco, uh, getting cars from point A to point B as rapidly as possible. But this kind of design was single focused and really created a blight uh, and was not context sensitive and didn't consider the holistic value uh, that, that that could generate if it was designed properly. So on this slide you can see 
how Marcadero Avenue looks today with the overhead removed and a holistic approach to design that generates a, a greater value for that real estate asset. So the community, the developer of the area, and the end users uh, benefit holistically. Uh, other impacts that uh, are currently going on in the inner city is the uh, introduction of residential living, uh, the conversion of negative or, or unused spaces into quality park and open spaces, uh, the internet, rapid exchange of information, the uh, focus and emphasis on getting out of our automobiles and using mass transit and off alternative modes of transportation is absolutely critical. And then the cost of gasoline is now uh, causing us to rethink uh, how we would work and play uh, in the inner cities of the United States. So some change agents that have caused this change in thinking uh, relate to the economic value uh, that development and real estate assets can generate. Uh, here's uh, Gerald Hines, Tram Pro, various other organizations and developers that are focused on quality began to impact uh, the Urban Land Institute and others in the way they promote quality development. Uh, from a social and cultural perspective, William White, uh, Richard Florida, various organizations like the City Parks Alliance, Project for Public Spaces. Uh, these change agents began to uh, cause people to think about the social and cultural value that can be generated through good urban design. Obviously, um, from a sensory perspective and from a uh, visual perspective, architectural community, landscape architectural community, various organizations, AIA, APA, ASLA, uh, Michael Graves, uh, Frank Gehry, other well-known architects, uh, Calatrava, Renzo Piano, various others have had a huge impact on how we value quality design in urban uh, environments. And then last but not least, the emphasis over the last several years regarding the environment and environmental conservation and sustainability. So various organizations like the Nature Conservancy, Trust for Public Land, Sierra Club, Green Building Council, uh, SSI, various others are focused on uh, quality development that generate environmental value. <clears throat> so, as we look into the future, here are some factors that are influencing and have been influencing our uh, design process and planning process for the last five or so years. First of all, uh, the recession, the great recession that we're uh, still involved in. Uh, has had a huge impo impact on uh, the cost of development. Uh, there aren't as many economic resources available to redevelop uh, inner cities, so there's a requirement for, uh, and, and really a benefit by creating uh, 3P partnerships and quality projects are getting developed through public-private partnerships, and the recession has had an impact on that. Uh, it, Deteriorating infrastructure in the U.S. I talked about the freeway system that was rapidly developed in post-World War II. Well, now that infrastructure is deteriorating. So as we replace it and, and renovate it, how are we going to design that so it has a greater holistic value and impact on the context of urban America? Uh, climate change is definitely a factor. We're experiencing that. Regardless of who you think is causing climate change, it is occurring, and we need to respond to it as designers and, and design in such a way that uh, it generates greater value by our response to climate change. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you see a map in the U.S. These are the 10 megapolitan regions uh, defined by research uh, by, at the University of Pennsylvania and a couple other research institutions that were focused on understanding where the population is going to be massing in the next 25 to 30 years. By the year 2050, 70% of our U.S. population will live in these 10 metropolitan regions. 350 million people are going to live in these regions. And consequently, that's where the jobs are for uh, development, construction, design, and that's where we're going to live, work, and play. So that concentration of population uh, really generates the, the 
critical nature of how uh, we design for quality and design for the greatest possible value uh, in the way we approach urban uh, areas. And then over the left hand corner you see uh, just the Central Park and the Millennium Park and how, how to really create additional holistic value by uh, changing uh, the, the green infrastructure of our urban environments. And now in the lower left hand corner, uh, the iPhone is a great example of holistic design. It incorporates multiple functions, it's multi-objective, and it's very well, uh, well designed and sexy in its uh, marketing presentation. And, and that's what I'm talking about in the way we holistically design urban areas. One of my favorite quotes is, consequently, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So what this presentation is about is new thinking and a different way of thinking about how we value real estate assets. Here's an artist's rendering that illustrates four image systems. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's futuristic. And the four image systems that generate value in this rendering are uh, the surface water systems, you see water and, and uh, you know, pools of water that, that people are enjoying, uh, the transportation systems in the air and on the ground, uh, and then architecture, which is a dominant factor in urban environments, and then also the green infrastructure, the green areas that you see in this rendering. How we design those holistic, holistically to generate greater value uh, is, is critically important in the way we uh, improve urban areas. This is a diagram that illustrates how to incorporate all four of those image systems to create a greater value, uh, quadruple net value, and I'll talk to you about quadruple net value in the future. This is an illustration, counter to the art artist rendering I showed you earlier, that shows a holistic approach to planning and design that incorporates those four image systems. So you see the the surface water systems, the architecture, the transportation systems, and the green infrastructure are all holistically designed to generate the maximum value. This happens to be a rendering of Songdo City in Incheon, Korea. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit to illustrate those four image systems about a suburban community in Houston called West Chase. Uh, SWA was hired to do the planning for this community that uh, was struggling with its image. Real estate values were declining, the quality of life was declining, and the city council said, look, we've got to do something to change the image and the values uh, of our community. So they hired SWA, and SWA looked at those four image systems. And so from a transportation perspective, the transportation systems were uh, totally rethought to convert existing poorly designed streets that were focused just on transportation uh, convert those into a more holistic approach where it generates great real estate value, economic value, social and cultural value, you see the activities on the street, environmental value with the green landscape, and then of course uh, uh, the sensory value and how people enjoy and use the, the, the space. Uh, another example of uh, uh, generating greater value by uh, redesigning these image systems, West Chase had these trapezoidal concrete canals uh, to handle runoff in Houston because it's flat and has flooding problems. And, and so SWA said, look, let's turn these into assets, not engineering solutions that get water from point A to point B as rapidly as possible, but let's holistically design these surface water systems and turn it into an asset and turn it into a valuable part of the community so that buildings run onto it becomes part of the open space and green space system and it adds to social cultural value. And then using utility corridors, as simple as a utility corridor, corridor converting it into green space and turning it into a greater value rather than just an eyesore that uh, everybody forgets about and backs their homes up. And then of course the architecture is critical. Good quality architectural design definitely impacts the overall value of the community. So here's some diagrams that uh, SWA prepared for uh, West Chase or West, yeah, West Chase to uh, evaluate how the four image systems uh, are incorporated into an overall plan, an overall design for various portions of uh, the community. Here's another example of uh, creating greater holistic value uh, through good
good design. This is a one block area in Sundance Square in Fort Worth. Currently, this parking lot is, pr provides and functions very well to provide economic value because it charges for parking in that one block area. It's also, whenever there's a festival in downtown Fort Worth on Main Street, uh, they clear out the cars and use it uh, to set up a stage and for an entertainment venue. So it does have some social and cultural value periodically. The next uh, element of, de of uh, elevated design for this space was to incorporate quality landscape, uh, perimeter enhanced streetscape with the bus and transit stop, uh, permeable paving surfaces, more trees, additional shade, and consequently this elevated level of design in this urban space now generates not only economic value, but social and cultural value, uh, environmental value, and also visual value, and adds value to the surrounding real estate as a result. The third uh, level of urban design uh, provides underground parking, a one block area park space for surrounding residents and for the community to use. It has a concert venue, uh, and it is a version that generates even greater economic, social, cultural, environmental, and visual value. So, a holistic approach to urban design definitely adds value. When I wrote the book, uh, the Urban Land Institute said we need to have a design forum and find out what leading urban designers in the country, uh, how, what elements of their design process generate value uh, for their clients. So we got a variety of people, including uh, uh, Fritz Steiner, who's the head of the architecture program at the University of Texas, uh, Mark Johnson, Frank Ricks, Bill Marsh, uh, Susan Maxman, and Ed uh, Feiner, who is also an Aggie, used to be the head of uh, the uh, government uh, building program for the feds, and now is with SOM uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, we got this group together and spent a day and a half at the ULA headquarters in Washington, D.C., trying to break down and understand just uh, what elements of design generate value. What should we value as designers when we're uh, looking at future projects? So, uh, they came up with it needs to be a comp comprehensive, holistic approach uh, involved in placemaking, connectivity, uh, visual value, sustainability, health and social value, functionality, the space needs to be programmed and functional well, and generate an economic benefit. So then we boiled it down into really four elements of, of, of understanding holistic value for real estate assets. So a real estate asset, a future design, urban design should generate social cultural value, economic value, environmental value, value and sensory value. So we then, uh, Professor Booth and I at Texas A&M in the graduate program in landscape architecture and urban planning and with the support of the College of Architecture uh, have uh, begun research involving those four elements of quadruple net value to really evaluate real estate projects and begin to understand what is their value. Now there are five stages in the development process uh, that, where you can generate value during conceptualization and we've done research on projects that are in conceptualization. Uh, during design, greater value can be generated through uh, enhanced design uh, value is generated during the construction process, then during the activation process when the project is, the program is activated and the, 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 the project is commissioned, and then during the operations management and staffing of the project. So we identify over here on the left hand column, you see the four elements of quadruple net value. Then we began to identify criteria in reaching those four elements and the metrics by which we can measure the value of a real estate asset. So then we broke it down uh, into these categories where we're looking at safety and security, accessibility, context sensitivity, multi-objective uh, results of the design, activity days and education days, residential proximity, place making, public involvement, connectivity, which kind of ties back to accessibility, and uh, public involvement. And from an economic standpoint, we broke this 
sit down uh, into uh, various aspects of economic value that a real estate asset generates, environmental value. Uh, here you see the Green Roof on City Hall in Chicago. Chicago has emphasized the environmental value as part of their urban fabric and identified these various criteria. Uh, and there are more than just what I'm showing you here uh, by which you can evaluate the environmental value of a real estate asset. And then the sensory return with the five senses. So we began research. Uh, first of all, in the book, we researched, I researched seven projects. And uh, I would call it a lower level of research because we didn't have the resources, the money, or the time to really go to the level of detail that we're doing at Texas A&M. But we looked at the San Antonio River, the uh, uh, town center in South Lake, uh, the uh, Central Expressway Corridor in Dallas, uh, Louisville University of uh, Cincinnati uh, campus, uh, the Louisville Waterfront, uh, and then the transit uh, facilities in Salt Lake City. In addition to that uh, research, at that lower level of research, uh, then uh, four years ago Professor Jeffrey Booth and I began engaging graduate students to evaluate existing real estate assets and use quadruple net value uh, criteria and metrics to measure what their holistic value is. Not just based on a spreadsheet. We've all been involved in projects where it's a bottom line kind of development real estate asset. Uh, I, and I regret my involvement in some of those projects where we just focused on the bottom line and didn't look at the overall holistic potential of the real estate development process. So we looked at a variety of projects. Uh, I want to credit uh, TBG uh, Partners in Austin uh, because of their involvement in the research and allowing us to use some of their projects. And they realized the value of of meshing academia with the private sector to uh, benefit each other. And uh, so we used some of TBG's projects, the Market Street uh, Town Center at the Woodlands, uh, University of St. Thomas, which is a university commons area, totally different type of project. The Dallas Design District, which is really a planning project for a, a uh, design dist a district in Dallas. And then Millennium Park, which uh, uh, we'll talk about more because we did an extensive level of research uh, at Millennium Park. So now I want to introduce you to a much higher level of research. Uh, in the summer of 2011, uh, I took two graduate students from Texas A&M. We uh, coordinated and partnered with DePaul University in Chicago and uh, decided I really wanted to do more a higher level of uh, research at Millennium Park, which is a internationally uh, famous green space. Now, this quadruple net value approach to valuation applies to anything from a, a house in a residential community to a region. But Millennium Park was a good example of how to incorporate uh, quadruple net value and evaluate the value of that park. Quadruple net value is the holistic value that real estate generates in an urban environment. There's a great deal of interest in understanding the value of good design. And of course Millennium Park is a, uh, a great research example of uh, how to measure the value of urban design. Millennium Park, covering 24 acres directly east of the Loop in the heart of Chicago, it's an award-winning location for art, architecture, and design. Since 2004, Millennium Park has quickly become an iconic symbol of the city recognized the world over. Millennium Park is evolving as a masterpiece of urban infrastructure. It has steadily grown in value during conceptualization, design, and construction stages of development. Quality programming and excellent management are now catapulting the park to previously unpredictable levels of sensory and experiential stimulation, economic returns, social and cultural advancement, and environmental benefits. A group of researchers from Texas A&M and DePaul University wanted to know what the impact of Millennium Park has meant to Chicago and its residents. In the past, real estate value has been measured by 
a spreadsheet or the financial value that it benefits, and that's that's a critical element. But there's a more holistic value that is generated uh, through investments in urban areas. We have recently begun to talk more broadly about the return to the community and to the stakeholders in the community. Dennis's book talks about social and cultural and sensory uh, as well as environmental concerns and, and so his notion of incorporating all of those becomes a part of the quadruple bottom line. The principles of the book are to apply metrics to the value of good design and uh, I've always had the uh, desire to research Millennium Park at a much more detailed level. Dr. Cannon was very interested in a combined uh, joint effort between DePaul and Texas A&M uh, to conduct the research. Well, Dennis wanted to bring up two Texas A&M students and we thought it might make sense for us to pair those with two of our DePaul students. Each student researcher was given responsibility for one of the four facets of the quadruple bottom line and asked to study Millennium Park's value to the city of Chicago. So Millennium Park generates social and cultural value, environmental value, economic value, and sensory value. The big question is, how do you measure that? That's what this research is about. Millennium Park has evolved from a wonderful civic idea into being the soul of the city. The park's evolution continues on a grand scale, which generates new experiences and repeat visitation beyond original estimates. The phenomenology of the park and its holistic value continue to increase beyond predictions. Millennium Park is a reflection of Chicago's energy and vision for the future. So now we're going to show a video of uh, how the research team evaluated the social and cultural value of Millennium Park. And I'll let them know in more detail. Moving beyond a traditional dollars and cents return on investment approach, the research team discovered social and cultural value added by the park. In 2004, around 3 million people visited the park, and now in 2011, it's going to be over 5 million, which is roughly a 67% increase. So it ramped up, it didn't, didn't go down, you know, it wasn't just a flash in the pan, the first year it's open, everyone wants to see it, and then the population goes down, but in this case it's going up. All those people are families, children, you know, it's a neighborhood. And as a residential developer, I have to emphasize the importance of that. I mean, you want to feel like when you walk into the heritage or the legacy, you're going home. And one of the ways to feel like you're going home is as you walk down the street to your front door, you see people. I think the thing that strikes me is the way that Chicagoans use this park. On any weekend day, there'll be wedding parties there. The notion that in the springtime now, students drive in from the suburbs so that they can come to the park and have their photographs taken. Um, the way that on any summer afternoon, or really spring and fall, you find the children playing in the fountain. Um, I don't think anybody really quite got that that impact was going to be felt for the community that lives here. The stories that we told had a lot to do with the economics of what it would do. It never did talk about it becoming the soul of the city or it bringing people together. That is something that I wish <laughs> I'd known uh, that it was going to do, but we didn't know that. This is not a traditional park. It is in some ways a major art installation. Certainly in, in Chicago, there is uh, no place that you can go free and get the very best other than a place like Millennium Park. People come from all over the world uh, to see Millennium Park and experience the art and architecture. So we get governments coming, uh, kings, princes, and princesses, uh, or visiting from all over the world uh, because they've heard about the park and they uh, want to see it. I think it is a point of distinction that Chicago is providing the very best art of architecture and design the world has to offer free. 
I mean, there's concerts, different exhibits going on throughout the year. You know, in the summertime, there's other exhibits. In the winter, ice sculpture exhibits. So it's pretty mm -hmm. amazing what what events are held at the park. I mean, 610 public events, free events in 2011. I mean, that's a staggering number. Chicago is the only place in the world that has a classical orchestra playing uh, in the park a full season free for all the people. The park strives to be inclusive of the community, not just along social and economic lines by providing free programming and cultural events, but also in accessibility. I think it's an obligation for architects to make sure that every aspect of the park is, is accessible and to create what we consider a universal accessibility. That means that if you're handicapped or you're able-bodied, the route you take to the park is the same route. There's not a special uh, route for, for people with disabilities. And because of that, um, it's considered one of the most accessible parks in America. And the uh, Paralyzed Veterans of America gave it a uh, Very Free America Award. But it's, a, it's a, an example that many civic leaders could learn from and are learning from. Despite the constant inflow of visitors, Millennium Park wants to be a good neighbor and does its part to reduce traffic and congestion. The McDonald's Cycle Center is located on Randolph Street in the northeast corner of the park. It offers 300 parking spaces for bikes, 250 rental bikes, but it's important because it offers an alternative mode of transportation for commuters in the Chicagoland area, and it allows people to park their bikes somewhere and go to work. It's clear that Millennium Park has become a cultural hub of the city of Chicago and is providing an abundance of social and cultural value. But it is the greatest gift, I think, a city can give. Uh, to its people. So the research was then uh, put into writing and to a written report and this is just a breakdown of some of the metrics uh, of the uh, social and cultural value of Millennium Park and you can see the visitation, acreage of new park land, later feet of walkways, uh, everything from shaded areas to uh, the amount of uh, Alternative modes of transportation, uh, art tours, uh, the companies adjacent to the park that claim that brand for real estate development. The social and cultural impact of Millennium Park is measurable, and these are just some of the metrics that are in the research report. Now we'll talk about the economic value. While its goal is to expand on traditional valuation methods, quadruple bottom line approach views economic return as a key benefit and the team was able to put together a detailed analysis. By going into the project uh, I expected to be able to identify significant um, economic value and we were able to do that and then some. The momentum is is all moving in the direction of an increased value um, across all asset classes. Apartment rents adjacent to the park, condo prices, retail rents They've all significantly increased. The economics are much greater than anything we imagined. Chicago Center City had been moving north to Michigan Avenue where the Tony restaurants and hotels were and back in the center loop area uh, was getting a little bit tired. It's hard to remember what that part of the city was like seven years ago. But um, it's definitely had a significant change as far as the general livability of the area. There has been a 57% increase in residential units since 2005 um, and a population increase of about 71% since the year 2000. The population has increased significantly over the last 10 years. It's bringing people back into the city, empty nesters, young professionals. So it, if you want to think about strictly an economic return, you could think about the um, property taxes that are paid into the city and the county. I think the, the most straightforward way to look at the return to investors would probably be to look at the major residential towers that have been built. At least 10 condo projects, residential condo projects around the park are attributing their success to the fact that Money Park is there. We're a view building. That's exactly what we call ourselves. We're a view building. We sell views. 78% of all the units in the building look at the park. There's so many things about the park that were important. First of all, we would have never built without the park. We were aware of the park. We knew the park was coming along. We pre-sold 70% of the building. 
before we opened the construction loan, we were 70% sold, which allowed for a very good financing of the property. It had a terrific reputation from the get-go. The team wanted to focus on isolating the economic value in real dollar terms of a condo with a Millennium Park view. We found that there's a significant premium paid for condos facing the park versus lake and city views. So because there's a lot of variables in condo sales, we needed to differentiate between the floor the units were sold on and uh, the views. Um, and there's few buildings that had enough transactions where we could make a distinction between the two. We identified $125 per square foot premium paid over the last few years. The evidence is clear. The park created value, the buildings made the park more attractive, the park makes the buildings more attractive, and everything builds, you know, and it, and it all works together. It's pretty clear of how significant of an economic impact Millennium Park has been, and it's been a clear return on investment for the city. Now, when Mayor Daley first proposed the idea of Millennium Park, and some of the civic leaders proposed the idea, uh, the residents of Chicago, of course, were up in arms. They've got crime problems, potholes in streets, uh, all kinds of infrastructure needs in the inner city portion of the city. And uh, the mayor came under a lot of fire for wanting to invest $490 million in a park when all these other uh, issues are concerned. So politically, it didn't look like a smart move. But in the long range, the holistic value uh, is, is phenomenal. And just looking at the uh, metrics of the economic value of the park, you can see uh, billions of dollars worth of new real estate value that has occurred adjacent to the park, uh, the construction value, all of the multipliers associated with the benefit to the economy. That half a billion dollar investment has generated uh, five-fold what uh, the city anticipated. So the economic value is very clearly identified. Now we'll look at the environmental value that our researchers uh, uh, documented. The next focus for the research team was environmental value. The team wanted to know how Millennium Park has contributed to a cleaner and healthier neighborhood. Green infrastructure and green space uh, have a positive impact on urban environments. The site the park is, is on top of was a blight in Chicago. It had no vegetation, it was just a sea of cars. So the mayor, to his credit, uh, decided that it was important to deal with this ugly landscape and, and create a new park. Millennium Park actually increased green space by 61%. This was through the addition of 550 trees, over 90,000 different plants, and 39 varieties. Due to the increase of trees on site, there are 427 pounds of air pollutants removed per year, and this amounts to over thousand dollars of savings per year. In addition to providing Chicago residents with an abundant green space so close to the loop, the park's design utilized eco-friendly construction practices that minimized its carbon footprint. The North Exelon pavilions both received a LEED Silver rating and the amount of energy savings they produce per year is worth over $2,300. They, they have photo cells and they generate electricity that helps uh, sustain the cost of electricity in the park. Millennium Park by title is a park but actually it sits on top of a parking structure which qualifies it as a green roof. And it's actually one of the world's largest green roofs. It is estimated that through Millennium Park's green roof, over 70% of water accumulated on site stays on site, and the remaining 30% is filtered through that soil and is diverted into Chicago's river. We also included um, sustainable design in the sense that we have a landscape that the garden in particular doesn't need a lot of water, it's uh, very little irrigation is required, they're drought, drought tolerant, all perennial plants, so we don't have to go back every year and replace plants, they come back on their own. Lurie Garden also contributes to the environmental value of the park by providing visitors with an opportunity to interact with nature and learn about the local ecosystem. So Lurie Garden offers over 15 environmental education programs, and there's programs for parents, children, visitors, or just community members. They have a, a bees tour to learn about the bees on site. The Larry Garden has over 160,000 plants on site. And it was surprising to find that 65% of them are native to North America or Illinois. So you can see an extensive amount of research was done on uh, identifying the environmental value of the Park. And this is a breakdown of some of those. We looked at everything from 
the heat island effect to uh, the carbon footprint uh, that was reduced by uh, the design of Millennium Park uh, to the lead certification for the piano, original piano design, the uh, solar power buildings, um, the IGO share facility. There's numerous examples of the metrics associated with environmental value. Now we're going to look at the research involving how you measure sensory value of Millennium Park. The final component of the quadruple bottom line approach, sensory value, measures the effect Millennium Park has on the five human senses. But how do you measure a smell or apply value to a sound? Sensory value approach to research is, is by nature both um, quantitative and qualitative. Uh, quantitative uh, meaning we can measure number of music events held, uh, visitors to the park for these music events, uh, but at the same time sensory value is also qualitative, it's, it's a matter of opinion. Uh, people value these iconic uh, elements of architecture. 70% of sensory value is visual, so the world-class art and architecture uh, have a huge impact on how the park is perceived and enjoyed by the general public. Within the park there are four iconic elements all created by world-class architects and artists. You have Gary's uh, BP Bridge and J. Pritzker Pavilion and then you also have the Crown Fountain by Plinza and then Cloud Gate by Kapoor. The value of Millennium Park would be diminished had the leaders and the visionaries for this project not brought these world-class artists and architects to the site. The story that we told to the community that stirred their blood was that we wanted to define Chicago to the world and to do that we would bring the world's best artists and architects and designers to Chicago and define the city. And that set a tone, if you will, for the park because when you go around to tell your story everybody knows that uh, that you're seeking something at a higher level. The iconic visual elements of Millennium Park clearly provide visitors with sensory value but it's not only a feast for the eyes. There's also uh, sound to all the concerts and the sights and sounds of all the public activities generate a very positive environment from the sound perspective. The Pritzker Pavilion houses the only uh, sound system of its type in North America, so obviously a premium was placed on sound quality. It was designed to um, create the effect of being in an orchestra hall where you actually hear sound uh, with reflection. Its trellis system and speakers located on the trellis provide uh, the people in the back just as good of a sound experience as the people that might be up close in the permanent seating. From a smell perspective, the olfactory nerves are influenced in a positive way in Millennium Park. Adjacent to the park, there are 18 restaurants. Uh, also, there are two restaurants in the park and three, sometimes four, food vendors. And all of these restaurant spaces add to the sense of smell you get from walking through the park or walking around the park. We do not want art that people couldn't touch. So the idea of uh, interacting with the art, even though uh, in some cases it costs us money because we have to clean the art more frequently, uh, to be able to get in the art, whether you're handicapped or, or a kid, um, all that was important. The artists were selected on that basis. Whether it's uh, Kapoor's cloud gate that you can touch, the water running from Crown Fountain that you can hear, the sound coming from the pavilion. And these elements weren't done uh, by accident. They were carefully planned and designed for by these world-class artists and architects. We did our best to report our findings in regards to sensory value, but if you haven't been, it's, it's definitely a place you need to visit and experience uh, for yourself. So we then broke down the metrics associated with sensory value. I often get questions, Jerky, what are you talking about measuring the five senses of a real estate asset? And you just saw in the video what we're talking about. But the retail uh, design community understands the importance of sensory value as well as anyone. And we innately, with our computer, our brain, use our five senses to perceive space. So we come back to a space where there is a positive 
uh, stimulation to our five senses. We do not return if a project is designed in any kind of a negative way. If it smells bad or we don't feel comfortable uh, from, from a design standpoint or uh, there's freeway noise or aircraft noise that uh, causes a negative reaction, our senses innately perceive and, and express whether or not good design has occurred and there's greater value uh, through designing ahead of time to respond to our senses. Last but not least, I'm going to show you a video that was prepared by our graduate students. Uh, Clyde Warren Park is a deck park uh, over Woodall Rogers in Dallas. And our students prepared this video to just re-emphasize the importance of designing for the five senses and generating greater sensory value uh, when we renovate urban space. Preservation 
Real estate value. This time, we'll be glad to answer any 